I don't want to go over these today. Uh, what name shall I use for him today? Alphonse. Uh, we'll do that during recitation. Um, but I want to make a few comments about the, uh, if you didn't do as well as you hoped, so for example, suppose, so the low score I think was uh, 12, 15, something like that. If you were that person, that doesn't mean you will automatically fail this class. It does mean you automatically fail this exam. Uh, so I posted the salute. Let me back up. I posted the solutions and the grading scale on the web. Uh, basically similar to last, last the other exam. Um, so 60 and up was A or A minus. I think 65 was the A, A minus line. Uh, either 45 or 50, or I think 50 to 60 is a B, all kinds of Bs. And 40 was the kinds of Cs, not counting C minus. And if you got below 40, then you need to make some changes to your life if you want to flash past this class. Um, so, uh, if, so, so I, I guess I should say a few words about what I do when I'm graded. It is possible for someone to have a very bad day. I understand that. So if you had a very bad day or a very bad week, that does not mean, so suppose you got a zero on this exam. That does not mean there is no hope of you passing the class. It means that I will look at your performance in the other grades on this test, I mean in this class, and I will possibly discount this score accordingly. That doesn't mean I throw out the worst test score. What it means is if you did much, much, much worse than your average, then I conclude something was wrong. If, of course, the standard deviation of your grades are all over the place, that is, you get a zero on this exam, a perfect score on the next exam, and right in the middle on the final, then I will average them all. But if it is clear that your grades do something like, then this one won't count so much, right? So my goal in assigning a grade is to assess, and this should be everyone's goal, to assess your knowledge of the material in the course. So we have four samples of your knowledge, the first midterm, the second midterm, the final, and the homework. And I view those as four samples. If you know any statistics, I'll view those as random variables. Well, I hope they're not totally random variables. But I'll view them as, with, you know, there's some noise here. So your, your actual knowledge is in some noise range. And this one maybe really has a big variation because that was a bad day. And so I'm looking for a grade somewhere here. So, so that means that if you did very badly, don't give up all hope, but take that as a sign that you need to do better. And if you manage to do better, I will give you a better grade than your average decides. If you did really much better than you should have, well, lucky for you. So, right, if your grades do this, then you still get the average, which would be somewhere here. So, you know, even though I should, by all rights, throw that one out too. But I won't do that. Okay, so um, a couple more comments. Please check that the addition of your grade was correct because I don't add so well. So if I screwed up and you know you got 15, 15, 15, and 10, and I said your grade is 12, it means I probably added wrong. And you should tell me. If your grades were 2, 2, 2, 2, and 2, and I said you got a perfect score, 
It would be nice if you would tell me, but I am not going to hold you to that. <laughs> you got luck? All right. Um, so, I thought already it was that. So, tell me if your grade is wrong. Also, if they, if you, well, anyway, yeah. And that's enough. So I don't want to go over the problems on the exam because I posted all the solutions. And Albert, oh no, we have to call him something else. Armando, I'm going to go over <laughs> that stuff in the recitation. So I want to move on. Are there any other, either administrative or any kind of questions? Yeah. When you calculate your final grade, you just use the percentage of final grade so that block. Yeah. So this, this counts for 25% uh, of your final grade. So if you got an A on this exam, and you get all zeros on everything else, then you probably got at least a D in this class. But, uh, yeah. Does the percentage of the letter, what, like what, what matters? The percentage of the letter? The letter grade. Like what do you the calculate? I calculate the number. Okay. But the number is not the percentage, right? Yeah. So here's what I actually do. I apply a piecewise linear mapping to your grade to put it on a standard scale where a 50 is the middle C. Then I average those. So, you know, so the number matters, but it's not the percentage, right? I guess it's piecewise affine, not piecewise. Yeah. Okay, so other things? Okay. Uh, so now let's go back to doing some math. Um, so, so I want to talk again. I talked briefly before about limits. These things multiply by the blockchain numbers, a lot of them. Um, So I'm going to talk again about limits, and so I want to remind you, so we have some function from the reals to the reals, and we say that the limit of f of x, as x goes to some number, let's call it a, is l, so pictorially, which is the way they teach limits in most calculus classes. That means that if you look at A here and look at the graph here, it means as you zoom in here, your height seems to go there. That's a really squishy definition. Um, the, the real definition of what this means, so this, so let's, let's call this a definition. Definition. This means that for every little number epsilon that you care to choose, there is some other little number delta, so that the difference, I guess I'll move up here, so that uh, f of x minus f of a is okay. Wait a minute. The deltas are down there, and the epsilons are there. Sorry, f of x minus l. Sorry, is less than epsilon whenever. things, x is in the domain of f, and x minus a is less than delta and bigger than zero. So that's another way of saying this, but what it's really saying is no matter how skinny around L you might choose, so let's choose that epsilon. So here's L, here's L minus epsilon, L plus epsilon. 
So you choose some distance around the point L, then there is some width here. I guess it's here. Uh, well, let's just use that. There's some width here, A plus delta, A minus delta, that traps the graph inside this box. Okay, so that says if you want to get within epsilon of L, you have to be, there's some number of delta, some amount of control that you can apply to the function to, to get it in there by being within some error of A. Okay, so that's the real definition of a limit, which I just crossed here. And the reason that I'm pointing that out is, I mean, usually in calculus one classes, that's glossed over a lot because it's, I don't know, too confusing or something. But it's important to realize now we want to generalize this to functions of more than one variable. So I want to generalize this to some function f from Rn to Rm now, so this is a vector function f. And I claim that everything is just the same as long as we interpret all the symbols in the appropriate way. So I'm going to say that the limit as x a vector goes to some point, actually, let me call it x0 now. Some vector x0 of my vector value function f of the vector x, I'm going to say that that limit is some vector L. So this vector is in Rn, this is in Rm, this is in Rm. So everything's the same except I put arrows over stuff. This means that no matter how small I want it, so for any, this can still be, this is my distance, any distance I choose, there is some other input distance. Why am I writing the negative? I don't know. There is some input distance so that Let me write it with two lines just to emphasize. The vector, the distance between the vectors x, f of x and l is small whenever the distance between the input vectors is small enough, but not necessarily equal. And this is and x is in the domain of f. So it's exactly the same except that, and so I'm writing double lines to, so here shouldn't that be a zero vector? I make a mistake? Should be a zero vector. This is, oh, wait, uh, no, no. no. No, it's a zero, zero. It's the zero vector in R, which is also the scaling. Um, so, so here, uh, let's call it, I don't know, B means the length of the vector B. Okay? So this is exactly the same as that guy as long as I interpret it properly. So it's saying if I want to get, if I want to say that f is getting close to some vector value l, I have to ensure that I take x close to my x naught. And if this is true, then we say the limit exists. Is this thing in the way? Should I put it lower? Maybe it doesn't help. Better? 
Okay. So why? So let me let me actually draw that picture in in the the situation of some function. So let's say my vector value function f takes r two to r two. So a function from the plane to the plane. And let me just draw this same picture in that way. So let's say the domain of f, here's the domain of f, it's defined in that blob, and it maps that blob over here, and I have my point x0, which is inside the domain of f, and this statement here says that I can draw, so x0 comes over here somewhere, let's call this L. This is again a vector, L. And F maps this blob, I don't know, some way over here. And what this says is if I want to ensure that I land within some epsilon of L, then when I pull that back, so this stuff maps onto that disk, there's some little disk here of distance delta around x0, so that everything in this disk goes inside here. Maybe I should color it red. So this red stuff goes to some blob, and maybe it's got a long finger, goes to some blob here around L, but it fits inside every little disk of epsilon that I can make. And if that's the case, then we say that the limit as we move in here is the same as that. Now, the reason that I'm, you know, this is, so in a, in a well, it's important to realize this is saying no matter how you move in close to x, not just along the coordinate axes, but no matter how you get there, here it has to get there too. Okay? So we saw examples, I don't know, two weeks ago or some time ago, where there were functions which were not continuous because they they moved, they were fine if you come in this way and if you come in this way, but if you come in that way, you get a different answer. So we had functions, so we have another way beyond this, you know, in, in, in one variable, we take a line, I'm just going to draw this analogous picture, and it goes to a line. This is not the graph of the function, this is just the image of this line. And if I shrink this in, then this has to shrink in. This is continuous, but something that takes this to that is not continuous. But here, we can sort of fold things in weird ways. So we have to be a little bit careful that stuff doesn't fold in weird ways. Okay. All right, so we have that. And I guess one other thing, I, I added this condition, x is in the domain of f. Maybe I have a function which is defined on this blob, this big blob, and it also sends this point, let's call it, I don't know, x2 to this point, doesn't matter where I put it, to this point, y2. So that point is called isolated. So a point in the domain so it's isolated if um, so 
also any small neighborhood of, let's call it X0, X1, of X1 intersects the domain in a single point. So that is, if I take any little neighborhood around X1, the only thing I hit in the domain is X1. Then that's called isolated. And a function is automatically, if it's defined at an isolated point, it's automatically continuous. Because there's no limit here. This just holds automatically. Right? So, so if f is defined at an isolated point x1, then we just say the limit of f of x1 is just f of x is just x of x1. So this is just to deal with weird situations where we might want to define a function at a point. So guys are automatically nice at isolated points. There's no way to move anything around. Okay? And those one of you? I don't know, actually. Is only one of you took 141 from me? She's not even listening. Okay, so. But I won't even talk to her. Fine. <laughs> well, let's just forget that statement. Okay, so we have this idea of limit, um, and the reason I want to talk, I want to mention the idea of limit here, well, so, so even though the limit is defined on a whole neighborhood, if we have our function We have it always defined in terms of coordinates, at least in this class. So we have f taking x1 up to xn to be some vector y1 up to yn, which we can write, this is f of x vector. Y vector. We also we have these coordinate functions. We can write this as f1 of x vector, f2 of x vector. Uh, this should be an m. Fm of x vector. Right. Yes? Everybody knows what I'm writing, or am I just writing symbols? Okay, so we have that. And so it's not hard to show. So the limit as x goes to some x vector goes to some x naught vector of f of x. Uh, is some vector L, which is L1, L2, up to Lm. These are all now scalars. Uh, so the limit is something exactly when the limit of each of the coordinate functions is the coordinate bit. So this is true if and only if 
the limit as x has to be the limit of x goes to x zero of the coordinate function fi of x vector is uh, L I. R J? No, F I. Yeah, yeah. In other words, this thing that eats a vector and gives a vector out, the limit exists if we just look at the coordinate functions that eat vectors and give numbers out. And that makes our life much easier. And let me not do the proof of this, but let me just tell you why it works. So, can somebody give me a hint why this would work? Or even what this is saying? Yeah, I can tell you what it's saying. Okay. Um, it means that if you take the limit of the individual components, so like you take the limit of F1 of X vector, mm -hmm. it means that it'll equal L1 of the scale. Yes. So we just can take the limit on each piece. And why does this work? Well, this works, I mean, if you just look at this picture here, we say we take something going in, and we look at what comes out, and we see that here it's trapped in this bit, and here it's trapped in this bit. And so as this shrinks to zero, these both shrink to zero. And as these both shrink to zero, this shrinks to zero. So we can just look on each of the coordinate axes and see how they shrink. Yeah? Why does it go towards x0? Like we have to have a limit going to something. But why does it go to 0? Would you rather I call this Jim? Or should it go up from 0? <laughs> 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 Feel cool. Um, so, it's not, I mean, x0 was just to give it some place to go. I was, I, in my notes actually, I called it A, but then when I get further along, I want to call something else A. Oh, you meant the issue. Yeah, no, it's just, it's Jim now. Okay. So, as, as things tend towards Jim. Um, yeah. It's Jim, so it's. No, that's fine. Okay. Right? I didn't say anything about continuity. I didn't say f of Jim is L. But I'm just saying x. So that, this is just saying we're here in the plane. Here's Jim. And here's some x that comes in some way and goes there. Okay? All right. Well, this is not the proof. <laughs> but the proof is really just this observation that as we squeeze this and squeeze this, that forces the circle to squeeze. And as we force the circle to squeeze, it forces these to squeeze. In other words, the thing that we're trying to f of x vector minus l vector is just the square root of f1 of x vector minus l1 squared f2 of x vector minus l2 squared plus blah 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 plus fm of x vector minus lm squared. Just the distance formula. All of these things if all of these go to zero, then that squeezes this to zero. If one of these doesn't go to zero, then this doesn't go to zero. So this observation is just another way of saying that picture. Okay, so yeah. You said, I thought I heard you say a minute ago that having the limit in that situation is not the same as it being continuous. That well, I didn't point. talk about what continuous means. So maybe that limit exists, but it's not what you want it to be. But it's a condition. Certainly, if I want it to be continuous, I have to have a limit. But if you have a limit, it's not necessarily... Not necessarily the value. 
Right? Just like in one variable, if I have just like in one variable, if I define a function like f of x equals the cosine of x for x not equal to zero and five and five and three quarters for x equals zero, the limit exists everywhere. The limit as x goes to 0 of f of x is 0. This definition doesn't affect the limit. This is well defined everywhere. And it's saying, you know, the graph of this function, the cosine, except here it's 5 and 3 quarters, while well, my scale's a little off, is not a continuous function. Now, I didn't define continuous yet, but sure. OK, thanks. But, so, I mean, limits are closely related to continuity, of course. But, yeah? Yeah, uh, why Because it's one. <laughs> and then also we have for all i? Shouldn't that be for all i? For all i between, what did I start with? One and m. So, this is not a proof. This is just a hint of how the proof goes. You want to read the proof, open the book to the appropriate page, and there's the proof. But it just does that. It just says, this can't shrink. So, I mean, I can do the proof if you want, but, you know, it'll take 10 minutes. So I don't want to spend it. Yeah? Why is it 1? Why is it 1? Because the cosine of 0 is 1. I mean, Right, the limit as x goes to 0 of this function doesn't even see this because we're only looking for x near 0, not equal to 0. So as x squeezes down to 0, it looks just like the cosine. And cosine is continuous, so it's just the value. But the value is 5 and 3 quarters of this function. I didn't say anything about derivatives. I'm only talking about limits. I'm sort of starting over but not really. No. No. Uh, there, this is defined everywhere. Here I can say, how about x bigger than 0? Uh, how about x bigger than negative 1 and x not equal to 0? And it's 7 for x equal negative 5. Negative 5 is isolated, because this is only defined from negative 1 and up. So this is isolated. I was just throwing the isolated in there in the case that we have an isolated thing. And I was talking about you, but you weren't listening, so it's okay. <laughs> um, okay. I guess another thing, another piece of terminology that I want to mention is a name which is that we have coordinate projection functions um, and well depending on in what context you are so the book says that uh, this is the function, I'm going to use the book's notation for a minute, pj, which takes, I don't know, rn into r by pj of x some vector is just, well, let's say x is the vector x1 up to xn, and the j projection function, the j projection function, just picks out the j coordinate. It's just a way of saying, forget everything except the j coordinate. <coughs> now, a more common notation, at least in more advanced math,
is to use the letter pi. But we're not using pi here because people get confused if you start calling a function pi. But it's fairly standard notation in a lot of more advanced mathematics to call these projection functions pi, pi the Greek letter p. So we use that notation sometimes. So I may actually, I probably won't use it in this class. Yeah. Pi is the one where you just pick out the j. Exactly. And, and then this book uses capital P, but it just it says pick out the J coordinate. Right, it maps to R. Right? So yes, right. it's R N in, and right. you R out. Right. So. It's just on the right side. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So. P two. Uh, one seven eight. Or pi two. Although also pi means something else in the fundamental group, but let's not go there. Um, okay. Hmm? Yeah, we need more letters. Yeah. So it's really confusing when you want to project the fundamental group. Pi of pi. So you only use Hebrew letters mostly for cardinality. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. It's just a second. It's a P2. 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 It's just a projection. It just means throw everything away except for the J coordinate. And P4 doesn't make sense because it's only a three vector. Okay? But this is sort of a standard function from Rn to Rm, and sometimes it's handy to use these projection functions to mess with higher uh, things. And I didn't do that yet. So I guess I need to define continuity, but it's sort of, now it's easy. So some function, some function f taking rn to rm is continuous at some point x0 in rn if the limit as x goes to x0 of f of x is, oops, sorry, I need something first, well, okay, is f of x0 so f is, so, is in the interior is in the domain. So, the limit is the same as plugging in. If that's true, then the function is continuous. It's exactly the same definition as in one variable. If when you plug in, it's the same as taking the limit, the function is continuous. Okay. Um, and then, just like in one variable, Uh, if f and g are continuous at some point, uh, let me just, yeah, at x naught and I want to follow these. So respectively, f is continuous at x naught y is continuous, g is continuous at y naught, uh, then so is the function f plus g of x 
f minus g of x, f times g, this is a times at x at the appropriate place, and also where, where it's appropriately defined, the composition. Okay, so adding, subtracting, multiplying, composing, continuity, still preserves continuity. Dividing also preserves continuity provided that you're not dividing by zero. Uh, divide by zero, then maybe. Okay. So continuity works just the same. We can preserve continuity. All that stuff is good. And it's pretty easy to show that, and this is really where I'm trying to get to, that any linear function Remember, so so a linear function, let's call it a matrix A, from Rn to Rm, is continuous at all x in Rm. So a linear function, I just take a uh, n by m matrix, Anytime we do that, this is easily seen to be continuous because we're just adding together the various coordinates and scaling them by some scale. To prove this, you use the projection functions, you bang down on each of the projections, and you see what it goes through. Let me not do that. Okay? So, any questions on any of this stuff? Uh, so the function that I'm talking about, let's call this a linear function, I don't know, A. My linear function A is the guy that sends A of X to just the matrix A times the vector X. So this is sort of stupid notation. But, right, it's just, you have, in other words, it looks like a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus a m x m a2 oh, 1 1 1 2 1 2 1 x1 plus a2 m x m a n 1 x1 plus a m m Right? It's just a matrix. So a matrix is a linear transformation. All linear transformations are continuous on all of their input space. Yeah? So let's say A2, 1, X1. Yeah, I need two. I need two indices because it's A is an N by M matrix. If, if you prefer, I could put a B here and a Z here. Am I going too fast? Is that too confusing? No? Okay. So, fine. So, why do we care? Well, we'll I'll show you in a second. We're almost there. So, 
because Well, so now I'm going to come back and define a little more carefully a function f from Rn. And let's just go to R for a minute. So this is a real value function on a vector input. It's going to be differentiable. at some point x naught which is in the interior to the domain of f that means that there's a, a neighborhood around it so that you can avoid the boundary um, if the following limit so there is a vector A so that, so A is also in Rn, so that the limit as x goes to x naught, or should it be gym? Maybe it should be gym. <laughs> now I understand. <laughs> um, so the limit as x goes to gym of um, f of x minus f of gym. <laughs> so I'm writing a difference quotient here. Um, divided by the distance between x and gym. Well, I want to say that this is a number. But it's not a number. Well, it is a number, but it's not just any number. And this is where this a comes from. So instead of writing it on this side, I'm going to write it here. It's the dot product of this vector a with the distance from where you're going. Yeah? When you talk about a vector approaching another vector, do you take like each of its components and like monotonically increase them for each component? No, you have to be a little more careful than that. So let me let me draw a picture. I mean if your function is nice, sure, that's good enough. But so, so let me draw a picture here. here. Here's Jim. <laughs> and I have some neighborhood around Jim. And I take any vector here, x, and it comes in in any old way. So if I just look on the coordinate axes, the function might be nice on the coordinate axes, but terrible if I do something like this. It's like you're targeting. I'm targeting Jim. That's right. <laughs> is it, is it up to you? This is like the map that Sarah Palin put up about, you know, what districts. <laughs> is it up to you to define how the vectors come in? You, can... you have to show it works for all ways. So really what I'm doing is I'm zooming in my scope. Okay, so you can have one component of the vector go really far off, but as long as it ends up... As long as it comes back. So in the end, you have to be trapped in this circle. Aren't you happy I picked on you today? Okay, so, so you shrink this entire circle, and the things that are trapped in that circle have to approximate, well, that's what this means. Equals or? This is a minus sign. Oh, I'm sorry. It equals zero. Sorry. Uh, 
So I really want to say that it equals bit. So another way we could write this is, so I guess another way you could write this is that the limit as x goes to Jim of f of x vector minus f of Jim vector divided by the length of x minus Jim vector vector equals a, which is a vector, times the vector x minus Jim But we scale it. Well, that's why I can't do it. Yeah, see, I can't do it. It doesn't work. I can't do it. What I want to say is that if I... Okay, I can't. It has to be written this way. So what this is really saying is if I look at this thing, as I zoom in more and more and more, it looks like... Here, let's write it separately. Looks more and more and more like a dot that direction. Notice this is a unit vector. So as I zoom in, it looks more and more and more like some vector a dotted with or projected onto this unit vector. So it's, it's saying, no matter, I'm sorry, I'll erase this picture again. No matter how I come in here, eventually I'm going to come in sort of along a direction. And on that direction, there's some vector A that works like it is measuring the dot product. I mean, the dot product is measuring the size. So, uh, this is, yeah. Um, so the limit is only going to be equal to zero if the top is equal to zero. And the top's only equal to zero if the two sides that are equal to each other. So why do you need the bottom part of the limit at all? Okay, so, so think about the one variable case. In the one variable case, I have f of x minus f of, I don't know, b over x minus b, and I take the limit as x goes to b. Right? This is f prime of x. So let me try and rewrite the one variable limit in this kind of language. Well, that's the same as saying that minus that is 0. And then I can scale this up by x minus b over x minus b. Except I don't want, the, I want this to be like that. So here we usually put an absolute value here and an absolute value here. But I don't want the absolute value, so I have to compensate for it by making sure that they come from the same side. But it just seems like um, this, this whole thing is just a complicated, like, only holds true if a way, way simpler, less case holds true, you know? Like, like the really simple case being the limit of f of x minus f of gym equals a dot x minus gym. You know, like, but we're saying there is some a so that they will be equal. Right, but you don't need any other part of the limit. You do. It. But it doesn't seem like you do because the only time that that limit is ever zero is when that top part is zero. Most of the time. You need to lose information. It's, it's saying, you're losing information, right, you're losing information. It's saying, if you scale things up, it looks more, so this is a linear function, right? Yeah. And we're saying, as we zoom in here, so this is scaling it up, so we're zooming in, and scale up the corresponding linear function, they look more and more the same. Is, is there any time that the limit is zero, but the top is an equal to zero? Well, it's more than just the top being zero. But uh, is, is it? This is tending. I mean, this limit, so this is never zero. X is never Jim. Okay. We're only getting close to Jim. Right. <laughs> um, but it's never equal to Jim. So let's say as you get closer and closer. No, I get that you need the limit. I just don't understand why you need the denominator. I 
mean, it's saying as you scale it up. But you, you, you can pair, you, you can just have a little scale it up. Or just like, <coughs> like, All right, well then, just, I mean, maybe you're right. I, I, I think that there's a counterexample, but I'm not going to know what it was. I mean, okay, so, so let me... So, this vector A, I called it A here, but it has another name, and some of you may already know what the name of that vector is. Does anyone know what the name of that vector is? This special vector A. So the definition says, well, it's not, it's not the derivative. Robert. It's Robert. This is how we write Robert. It's the gradient vector. Oh, mine was pretty close. Oh, it is. Oh. It's the gradient of F. Yes, the gradient of J. And that's what A is. So A. This, this particular A, if it exists, is called the gradient vector. Now, many of you know, really, the following theorem. So if you've done any multivariable calculus before, or seen any multivariable calculus before, it says that if We have some function from Rn to R is continuous. I'm going to stop thinking on Jim. Continuous, not continuous, differentiable, sorry. It's differentiable at x0, then the gradient of f at x0 is just the vector partial f x1 at x0 partial f x2 at x0 blah 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 partial f xm at x and that's unfortunate that I used we'll pick on Jim one more Okay, so that is, so in other words, so let's just do an example. So suppose that f of x is, I don't know, x, y, no, the x, y, what's z? Is x, y, plus z e to the x, y. So that's a function from r3 to r. So the gradient of f, this function is continuous everywhere. The domain is everything. So at any point x, y, z, the gradient is going to be take the partial of this with respect to x. So that gives me y plus yz e to the xy, that's the first x bit, and then uh, with respect to y it gives me x plus xz e to the xy, and then the last one that's zero, and that's e to the xy. This is not a d, this is a Nap line. I don't, I'm not playing on trying to. Um, which I think you type in Mac OS with all the J. Anyway. Um, 
Okay, so, sorry. Okay, so this vector is easy, very easy to calculate. You might also write it as y plus yz e to the xy i x plus xz e to the xy j e to the xy. Yeah. Uh, for this zero for that, yeah. is that a df or a partial f for the partial x of n or n? This is an m. Because I don't have m things, I don't have n things. Okay? So, so this is kind of like a kind of derivative vector. It's not. Well, it's a vector that's related to the derivative, right? It tells us stuff about it, and in particular, it gives us a good sense of where the tangent plane is. Um, but here, you know, it's, it's even a little bit hard to think of this tangent plane because this is a vector in R3. This, this well, we'll see later what geometric meaning this thing has. Um, so right now it's just that. And maybe, so this is not a definition, right? This is a theorem. This, this is the definition. We find some vector that when we dot it with the function, it works nice. It gives us the limit as we zoom in. So let me say, a few words about the proof. So the proof actually is pretty easy. Um, so you just write A to A. So suppose that A exists. It's a lot shorter. Sounds almost the same. Um, uh, so suppose that vector A exists, the one that makes this limit work. The thing that when you zoom in, it looks more and more like the function. And then we just want to show that this A has to be that. Because the hypothesis is it's differentiable, so that A exists. And then we want to show that's what it has to be. So what do each of these things mean? These things mean I come in on the various coordinate axes. And so I can write, so I can write A as, well in fact let's, A as the vector uh, A1 plus T, not epsilon, uh, E1, A2, plus t e2, I guess I should write this as a sub t, up to a n plus t e n. So really what I'm saying is I have this vector, let's draw it in two, here's a, and I write it, let's write it actually, a plus epsilon. So I write the little neighborhood of A in terms of the coordinate pieces. Right? So, so A is my, and somehow I lost Jim. Jim became A. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that's because I switched from, oh well, it's okay. So, so if I write it that way, then, then notice that if I just look at, I can now look at this piece by piece. Um, I can just look at this limit. So these are all gyms. It's <laughs> Um, Yeah. So I can just look at this on each piece. Right? So on the jth component, so if I project this, on the jth component, I just have a derivative. Uh, It's also possible So if the partials are continuous functions, then it's easy to see that the function is differentiable. But sometimes, even if the function can be differentiable, even if the partials are not continuous. Um, so an example, let's just, an easy example, well, an example of this, because all of these different, well, is the function 
from R1 to R1, which is, say, x squared sine 1 over x if x is not 0, and 0 if x is 0. So this guy, if you just go through the definition, then the derivative at 0 is 0. But the partial derivatives, which are just the same as the derivative, is not continuous. Okay? So, there's a name So, the name uh, definition So you say that a function f is continuously differentiable at some point if two things happen. F is differentiable and also partials are continuous. So we say that a function is continuously differentiable if we can take the derivative and that derivative that we get is continuous there. So if you remember, I mentioned this Clairaut's theorem a while ago that said the mixed partials are equal when the function has continuous partials. So this is exactly when Clairaut's theorem holds, that is, Given this, then df dx is the, the second derivative, the second partials. Fxy is fyx. Okay? Yeah? Do you have to go to the third, for like three dimensions for x, y, z? Say you were doing it. This, what I wrote here works for okay. 17 dimensions if you want. All right. So, yeah. so it wouldn't necessarily be the second derivative for the No, no, just the second. Just oh, really? each of the, so, if your function is continuously differentiable, then f of xz is the same as f f df dx d dz is the same as d f dz d dx in that case. Okay. Or y, or q, whatever variables you have. Just the mixed partials, the okay. second derivatives, doesn't matter which way you go. Okay. So this is really the same as saying the to tangent plane, there's a tangent plane and it moves around in a nice way. So f being differentiable means we can write, we can find a tangent plane. And being continuously differentiable means if we move a little bit, the tangent plane only moves a little bit. And yeah. So I guess I kind of ran out of time. Too bad. Okay, so I was going to talk about directional derivatives, but I guess I'll have to push that off until Wednesday. Um, so, uh, those of you that, well, I guess it's not due until Wednesday, so. If you, wanted, if you did your, your homework that was due on the test, you can give it to, let's say, what's another game there? I'm running out of it. Huh, Alfred? Well, you can give it to Alfred.